Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming a very special guest. It is the 45th anniversary of the classic family movie, Benji. And I'm talking about the man who wrote and directed the film itself, Joe Camp. Yes, I'm having the legendary Joe Camp on the show today to talk about the Benji movies, where he got the inspiration from, and the phenomenon of the movies. And uh, he also did some other movies, too, that were not Benji-related that I want to talk about. A western called Ha Ha Omps. I, I don't know. I can't pronounce it. He, he'll be able to pronounce it. Uh, the Double MacGuffin. And one Benji movie that has Chevy Chase turning into him called Oh Heavenly Dog. And I want to find out about all that stuff today. And I can't wait. I just cannot wait. It's going to be so awesome. So, yeah, here is my interview with Joe Camp. So, uh, welcome to the show. So, you're doing good today, sir? Yeah, I'm doing doing well. I'm a little curious as to why you wanted to uh, talk to me when you were uh, an expert on spooky movies. <laughs> <laughs> I Well, I love all types of movies, not just uh, the horror movies and stuff, and... Uh, Benji is celebrating its 45th anniversary this year, so I wanted to end the year on a, a, a good note like that. Oh, that's great. I appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure, sir. It's such an honor. Thank you for taking the time today. No worries. So, uh, going back in time, uh, long before the Benji movies, what was the career trajectory you were on? Did you always want to be a filmmaker? Not always, but probably from about the third grade on. <laughs> it's a, <laughs> I, uh, I have memories of sitting in a theater watching Disney's uh, Song of the South mm -hmm. and tears streaming down my face and just wanting to be a bigger part of things making people feel so good. And uh, it was always there through the rest of my years in high school. Uh, a few friends and I had our little 8mm cameras out making movies, silent movies, uh, for the most part, because this, there was no such thing as digital video tapes. Mm -hmm. There were not even stripes on 8mm at that point for sound. <laughs> uh, so we made our silent epics. We had one that was sound. It uh, was We recorded onto a tape recorder. That was, of course, never in sync with the film. But yeah, it was. And I wanted to go to UCLA uh, really badly. And uh, ultimately, my dad talked me down from that and said, Give me two years at Ole Miss, and if you still want to go to UCLA, we'll see if we can work it out. <laughs> uh, and after two years, I. I did. I, uh, I applied to UCLA and was turned down by three tenths of a grade point for an out of state student, which was due to one semester at the lake, <laughs> having <laughs> parties and so forth. And yeah. uh, learned a, a really great lesson there because it, uh, it taught me to uh, never again lose something that I had control of. That I could have made the difference on, but but interestingly, the, the, at least it is to me that uh, there were a lot of really bad times, devastating times mm -hmm. in this process. That literally, I thought, and, and being rejected at UCLA was one of them. You know, I thought that was the end of the world. Yeah, it was over as I knew it. There would be no filmmaking. It would be no anything because UCLA, of course, is you know, one of the best, if not the best, film schools on the planet. And, uh, but basically, I, it took me years and decades, really, to really understand this and to learn uh, something about it. 
but it was basically God saying, nope, you're not going to UCLA because you're going to need advertising and marketing so that you will not be afraid to distribute your first movie when all of Hollywood turns it down. Yeah. And, and that was the second big devastation in my life. <laughs> we went out there with the finished film, and everybody that we had shown it to you know, thought it was wonderful, and every studio in town turned it down for distribution. Wow. And we had uh, really had no choice but to either throw it in the trash or figure it out. And throwing it in the trash was not really an option. So yeah. we, uh, we went to work to, to figure it out. And that uh, was the result. It, 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 it's like that all the way through the process. It was, it's, you know, my biggest thing that I am trying to convince people of right now is you can't lose till you quit. Yes. And that, that's a big, big message and, and you know, because you know, all of the devastations and all the years from the time I applied to college and all of that I now know were basically just God tuning me up, strengthening me, giving me the, the stuff that I was going to need when, I, when it really counted, and t- teaching me how to get around, under, over the obstacles that any worthwhile dream is going to throw at you, and to never quit, to never give up. And that's uh, really what it was about. We just kept going and <laughs> we did it. And literally a year, within a year, close to a year, Mm-hmm. After uh, all the studios in Hollywood turned it down, the uh, publication Variety reported that he, uh, then she was the number three picture of the year. Wow, that, that's perseverance, I have to say. You know, that's what I'm attracted to. I had a car accident four years ago, and I spent 30 days in a coma, and I can't believe I survived that. And so when I hear stories about people persevering, it just makes me uh, admire them even more. Yeah, that's a, it's a story. There's a fellow by the name of Andy Andrews who's a really good motivational speaker, and he's an author and whatnot. And he, uh, he tells the story of the uh, Aborigine tribes down in Australia. Mm-hmm. Now, many of them, not most of them, uh, consider themselves to be rainmakers and the planters down there go out and find these guys when they're, when they're having a drought and bring them out in to try to create rain for their crops and whatnot. And this one fellow heard about a tribe that was 100% successful. They were batting a thousand and uh, never failed. Mm-hmm. And he was intrigued, so he went out looking for this tribe, found them, got an audience with the, uh, with the uh, king of the tribe and went in and the guy says, very nice to meet you. What can I do for you? And he says, I, I hear that you guys are 100% successful. Is that really true? And he said, yes, it is. He said, how you do that? How, how are you 100% successful? The king just looked at him and smiled and said, we don't stop till it rains. And that's a great, great story. <laughs> Yeah, it is. He had it all. He had the, you know, he had the clue. He just didn't give up until it rained. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so, so what made you want to make a movie about this amazing family dog? Uh, my wife and I, who is now deceased, but the, my first wife is deceased, mm-hmm. out of a sudden cardiac arrest. Whew, terrible. Ninety-seven. It was. It was uh, another really awful time. But we were back in the day when the the old Disney uh, Sunday night show. I forgot what they called it, but it was, it was it was before video, before CDs or anything. Mm-hmm. And uh, we would sit down and watch. Disney show an hour long, and we'd sit down and watch it every Sunday night, and kids would sit with us, and then they'd go to bed, and we'd go in and do the dishes, etc. And this one particular night, they were showing clips from some of the, the uh, animated classics, like Snow White, uh, that sort of thing. 
my favorite as a kid was Lady in the Tram. Mm -hmm. And they had a clip from that on there, and it started me just thinking. And when we started doing the dishes, I, I said, what do you, do you think it would be possible to tell a story like that from a dog's point of view, but do it with real dogs and no silly voiceover, you no know, Rex Allen saying, and now Benji thinking, that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. really let the dog tell the story, be the three-dimensional character that they are in the uh, you know, in Lady and the Tramp, for example. That, you know, the, they are where your heart and soul is. Usually the, the live-action animal movies are, uh, the dog is really just a prop. Your heart's always with the kid who's got to get rid of the dog because he's killing the chickens or something. And so the humans are, are really the ones that are the emotional connections within those movies, and, and the dog is there to help stimulate that. But I was thinking of a, of a show just like Lady in the Tramp, where the story is literally told by the... Uh, dog himself uh, through what he does and how he emotes and acts on the screen and literally acts like a human. Now finally, we finally kind of threw it out and said, you know, how are you going to tell a story, a real story, without words, you know, without talking and describing and yeah. dialogue back and forth. And so my wife went to bed and uh, I stayed up with a book and our little Yorkshire Terrier, whose name was, of course, Sir Benjamin of Courtney, called Benji. And so I was got intrigued with the, with the dog, still thinking about this concept, and would watch him, you know, when a siren would go off down the street or a dog would bark next door or, uh, you know, the outdoor sounds at night, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. and, and watch him react to them. And I got intrigued by it, and I, and I, I got down on my hands and knees and crawled around with him and did stupid things and got over in the corner and huddled up like a, a fetal position saying, oh, no, oh, no. And the dog's looking at me like, what in the world is the matter with you? Are you sick? <laughs> and it was, it, it was funny, but I went to bed saying, you know, dogs do talk. If you're paying attention, if you're up close and personal, they do talk. They let you know what they're thinking, and what they what they want to do, and how happy they are, or how happy they aren't. Mm -hmm. And at that particular time, I had myself and two other friends were trying to break into writing. I was working for an advertising agency in Dallas uh, as an account executive and so forth. And I was friends with two of the art, artists in the art department and. We were talking about writing and, and doing stuff, and so we had decided that we were going to take on uh, trying to write for television and uh, like situation comedy type thing. Mm -hmm. so I was getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning every morning and writing for two hours before waking up the family, eating breakfast, and then going off to work at the advertising agency. And... Uh, Mm -hmm. Next morning, I was right in the middle of, of a, a theatrical script that we were working on, and I woke up the next morning, went in there, pushed everything aside, and started typing as fast as I could. And the story fell out of my body onto the table, and uh, literally, I mean, I, I would spend those two hours generally writing maybe three pages of double-spaced screenplay mm -hmm. pages. And you've seen screenplays, you know that there's not many words on them anyway on a page because yeah. of the way they format it. But then I double-spaced everything so I could go back and mark it up. And that's what I did. This was a typewriter. This was not a computer. This was one of those old upright underwoods. And... Uh, very soon I, I pushed it aside and just started writing in hand uh, because I couldn't type fast enough you know, two or three fingers 
cycle to cycle. And, but um, it became time for me to go wake Carolyn up. I had just wrapped it up, and it, it was a mess. It was, I, mean, I couldn't read it myself hardly. So I went in and I woke her up and I said, I got to read you something. She said, Oh, no, you know the rule. You let me read it. I don't want to listen to you read it. And I said, No, I can't because you can't read this because it's so old or what happened. So anyway, I read it to her. And when I got through and looked up, it's about seven. I mean, when it, when it was typed, it turned out to be about seven or eight pages. Mm-hmm. Treatment of sorts on the on the movie that it fell out of my head that morning. And when I got through reading it to her, I looked up and there were tears coming down her cheeks. We had done that. And the first effort was, of course, to try to sell it. And we had gotten to be good friends with a, an agent out there through the work that we were trying to do uh, to get started in television. She was with William Lawrence, and, and she said, well, I can't be your agent right now until you sell something, but I, I'll help you. And so I sent her a copy of it. She passed it around Hollywood, the general concept, uh, the general uh, conception was that it would be impossible to do, and besides, Disney's already done it. And if you don't animate it, you couldn't do it anyway. Mm-hmm. And so it went on the shelf for a while. While I went through the process of learning film production while we were writing, the agency had a, a client in uh, a town just north of the Dallas-Fort Worth area called Denton, Texas. It happened to be one that had two really high-end state universities in the town of, I think it was, that that time it was you know, something in the order of, 20,000 people or something. And you're right square in the middle of the country. And so they had, they wanted to do an industrial development program to bring people, bring mm-hmm. companies, corporations. To them. And I was the low guy on the telephone, the totem pole in, uh, at the agency. And so I got thrown at the whole budget of the, the annual budget of the state of the town was $40,000. Fifteen of that was going to the agents for fees, <clears throat> so there wasn't much to spend even in those days. It was a pretty tiny little budget, so I was able to, to kind of flex my wings a little bit and try things that normally they wouldn't let me get by with if it was one of their bigger accounts and so forth. To find out that you know my brain was about as good as anybody else's. I was constantly going back to my office after presentations and saying, that's not going to work, and this is why. Why is it good? These are people are supposed to know what they're doing. And so I was, before it was all over with, I wound up being called in two or three times for the pause because I was causing <laughs> such a stir around the, the agency. But the, uh, the to make that relatively shorter story than the, uh, in the second year, the first year of the program was super successful and it was way out on the limb. It was super. Most people with that kind of budget would do, you know, little bitty ads and a lot of the business publications and the industrial publications and just try to get, you know, a, a response here and there. We did three full page ads in uh, Fortune magazine. Blew the wow. Whole, boom. And the first one Headline was get your free sample of Denton, Texas, and the whole pitch, of course, was that this is a this is not only a midwestern town and with you know high labor poss- you know possibilities you know in the population of mid- middle Texas, and, uh, but it's it is also a very high end educational base because of the two universities there and the number of PhDs live in this town, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so. And, it was a, and they had a great attitude. The Chamber of Commerce and the people on the street, you know, were really proud of what their town was. And mm-hmm. it was a rare time when you, you know, have a guy pumping gas to you, trying to sell you on the city of Denton, kind of thing. And, and I was impressed by that too. So that's a free sample of Denton, Texas that they got. <laughs> was an 
LP that was a 10-minute presentation of original music, songs, and and, uh, and words. And, and I don't know if you're, you're probably not old enough to remember a guy by the name of Hans Connery. Oh, yeah. I remember him. He was uh, you know, kind of a Shakespearean actor. Right. He was British. But he had a, a British accent, or you know, slightly British. He had a very intellectually British accent. Right. But he was an actor, and 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 I thought that would be you know, a really great voice to counter the the pretty general look from you know New York and uh, Los Angeles and etc. Major metro areas, you know, looking down at the South, looking down at Texas. So he did the narration through the whole thing. And it, it, and it really worked really well. The other two ads, that, that, that was the biggest ad, biggest response ad for industrial development that Fortune magazine had ever had. And so I, you know, he, he, he was building momentum in the agency, so they just kind of shut up and let me alone. <laughs> but I wanted to do because it was, you know, the client was just happy as a clam. And in the second year, we decided to use that, that uh, LP as a soundtrack for a film and go on the road, take 40 or 50 people from Denton and go to L.A. and San Francisco and Chicago and major industrial centers and, and do a luncheon and a presentation and bring the cast an on-stage show that turned into the movie and everybody went home with an album, you know, for uh, mm. taking the soundtrack of the film that they would seen home with. And, and, uh, and it went over very, very well, but the, they couldn't afford to do the movie in the first place. And so I proposed to them that myself and the print production guy at the agency who knew enough about cameras to have shot football video from the top of the press box for his high school coach when he was. <laughs> and so I told him that he and I would do this on the weekends for no cost except what it costs to do it, you know, buy the film and rent the equipment and that sort of stuff. That they would go about the business of going out to the uh, North Texas State University film program pretty weak, but they, all, they had a big uh, drama department, too, mm-hmm. and so they got us a bunch of interns to, you know, go and fetch and carry and whatnot. We go out there every every Saturday and Sunday, spend full days shooting and reshooting and reshooting where you know, things were not going exactly as they uh, I'll never forget that one of those kids from Texas State came up to me one time and said, you know, they don't have a film direction program in North Texas State, and that's what I want to do. I want to be a film director, and the only thing I've got is, is this stage direction that they've got. You know, Tell me what to do. <laughs> I started laughing. <laughs> I said, you, you may not realize this, but this is the very first time I've ever done this in my life, and you're asking somebody who obviously doesn't know what the heck he's doing because we're <laughs> redoing about, about everything that we do. Yeah. And, and you say, well, well, how do you do that? I say, you just do it. You find your opportunity and you just do it. And you do it wrong and you make mistakes and you, you correct them. And, you know, like I said earlier, you know, there is no losing. It's, you know, winning. We're learning. <laughs> and he uh, he kind of walked off shaking his head. But oh, he, he did say to me, he said, he said, but I don't know any of the terms. I said, what do terms have to do with it? So, you know, like cut and things like that. You know, I don't know all those terms. Nobody will think I know what I'm doing. I said, does it matter? Whether they know, I mean, say stop the camera. It works just as well. I promise you, you're doing it. <laughs> and uh, it, uh, and so the whole, the whole thing was really pretty funny. But it, and I look back at it and it says, oh my gosh, <laughs> you know. But it, it really worked for the time and did a great job for the client. And 
it was the first thing that I did. The second thing that I did was because one of the agency clients, another agency client, saw that one and wanted one like it. So I'm not supposed to be in the creative department. I'm not supposed to be doing film work. <laughs> so we got to go out, and with a little bit more money, we were able to use the services of one of the uh, uh, film production, you know, commercial production houses in town that did mostly industrial films, television commercials. And and it was a nightmare. I mean, it, I, I did some of the most stupid things in the world. I, we, it was an original program for a convention mm -hmm. of this company, and you know, it was a multimedia thing. You know, with three screens, and actors, and singers, and you know, all that stuff that goes along with that kind of. A, presentation and then after it was over with they wanted a film so that they could take it to all the distributors and dealers and so forth that couldn't come to the, to the convention and so since we already had a soundtrack for it we just re recorded the entire soundtrack the singing as well as the talking mm -hmm. and then went out and shot to that not knowing that you have to have a recorder and a camera that are somehow keeping themselves together. You know? <laughs> and consequently, when we got into editing, you know, we, we had shots that would last maybe two or three seconds, and then they'd start falling out of sync. And we went back and did some more shooting so that we could do cutaways. And all, yeah, it was an unbelievable mess, but it wound up, we wound up making it, forcing it somehow to come together into a really good, watchable project for that client and not too long after that I got over and they loved it and they took it you know made a bunch of coffee around the country with it and whatnot. And, wow. And, I, and then I got a call from the production house from uh, a guy that I just wanted to ask you if you had any interest in moving over here and being a commercial director. Wow. Punk. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. What, what? Out of nowhere, you know, this guy. And he says, Yeah, you know, we followed your process through the editing on this thing. We figure this guy can do that good when he doesn't have a clue. Imagine what'll happen if he teaches we can teach him something. <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, they they offered me a job. I was scared to death to ask for the money to take a raise from where I was at the time and they wound up bumping it because it didn't work out for them to, to work on a monthly basis. They do film production with a weekly thing. And so we have to round it up to $300 a week or whatever it was. And uh, I was just blown away. And so I, I did that for a couple of years and got really frustrated with it because they, Dallas at that time was a market at... Uh, If you want it done well, go to L.A. or New York. If you want it done cheap, come to Dallas. <laughs> I have the reputation that, that Dallas had from with the, you know, on the advertising agencies around the country. And yeah. Uh, so yeah. trying to convince the management of this company I was with to take steps to change that sell spots with more money and uh, mm -hmm. you know to uh, go on and, and, and make an effort to do better work so that we could attract better advertising agencies with bigger budgets etc cetera, etc cetera. and they just weren't interested and so I enlisted a couple of guys at Jameson you want to go out and do their own thing Yeah, how, how would we do that? You know, we were all living paycheck to paycheck. And, uh, and I had now two kids. And uh, I said, well, I, you know, I, I know some folks that I think might be possible investors. Mm -hmm. So I went back to the advertising agency people who had 
got really frustrated with me with all the shenanigans I was pulling to get things done over at the agency. But we're really appreciative of the work that was done as well. And they had an investment group that consisted of all the department heads at the agency and was managed by the head of the agency and his quite an investment thing. So I, uh, I went to my undercover person in that group, talked to her about it, and said, yeah, it's a great idea, it's a great idea, and I think he'll love it. So we went in and got the fun. The only problem with it was that they wanted they wanted me to, so we were asking for $50,000 to last us a year. Mm -hmm. And he, my ex-boss said, no, 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 you can do this and with $35,000. I, you know, I, I, I'm not an expert. I don't really know for sure, but this is what I think we need in order to make, because we're making a change in, in the way people look at Dallas film production. And at the end of the day, he said, no, nope, there it is. Take it or leave it. 35 grand. So and the chance that we were going to leave it, so we, we took it. Wow. Amazing. Travel the country. We went to advertising agencies, you know, and I had maybe two spots. We get the first job that we got was a real close, had become a really close friend of mine that uh, is in the advertising business in El Paso. Mm -hmm. And he gave us some spots to do. That gave us an opportunity to really. We had a reel that was fairly good to make it a real, honest to God, demo reel. Mm -hmm. It had to have a few more slots on and they were not so terrific. But uh, we spent nine months at work, you know, uh, kind of thing happened. <laughs> uh, creative director for, for an agency in Dallas called the Bloom Agency. Mm -hmm. Came in and he had a, he had a seven box, six, seven, eight, seven, six. Really well written. And they were going to cast really big, you know, classy actors and known actors in the Right.
<laughs> it was really one of those scary things. The two guys that I was writing, one of them is, was, became a stockholder. We opened our doors as a part of the deal with the agency uh, people. And, and so he was down at the IRA. He, he was a hard shell Southern Baptist. First Baptist Church in Dallas, which was at that time the biggest church in the country, I think. Certainly the biggest Baptist church. Mm -hmm. and, and so he went down to IRS. Not, maybe I can find a good Baptist down there that will give us a slack here. And he found somebody to extend it. He literally did. And, uh, and he was out looking for people with money. I had a meeting with, I prepared some really good material. Mm -hmm. of company showing what was happening. You know, the spots were already done for Bloom, and we had, I don't know if we had them on the demo reel or they were just got, getting on the demo reel, but the whole word and the whole atmosphere was changing, and we were um, about to turn the corner. And I had the facts, the figures, spreadsheet, the whole enchilada, mm -hmm. and no deal. The boss apparently was embarrassed that he said, you put the pressure on, they, they can do it for 35000 And the funny thing about it, when it was all said and done, we had the 50, we'd have made it through with that group, but we would probably never made a movie. Wow. Because they weren't, they, they weren't the kind of people who knew every rich witches in Dallas and pull them all together and everything. The bottom line is Irwin, the Southern Baptist writer, mm -hmm. so hard, uh, brought in his one of his clients, an insurance guy. Mm -hmm. And he's an insurance guy that has done very well in insurance and knows plays tennis with all the, the whole bunch of big balance. Super, her deal is one of them. Huge uh, contractors doing commercial buildings for all of the balance. And they, uh, uh, and brings it in and, and pitches this guy because he, he had a teddy lunch with us two or three times just because he was over in fact, he had an office in that same building that we were in. And uh, so he came down and wanted to came down to our, our new office and wanted to hear the pitch. And we gave him the pitch. And what about to happen in the whole thing? And he was just flabbergasted. He looked at our books. He looked at everything he wanted to look at and walk out of there saying, here, let me put all this together and digest it. We'll talk tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow he called Irwin that I'm out. I, it just doesn't make any sense. You know, there's no rhyme or reason why these other investors would walk out on this if what Pam is saying is true. So he, what he was telling Irwin was, you know, I just, it's just not my business. It's not something I'm interested in. And he was kind of skirting the issue. Mm -hmm. He didn't want to call me a liar to his face. But we finally, you know, I, 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 I called him and tried to talk to him. No deal. And I said, Irwin, I think you need, you need, you need to go at him. I said, He'll talk to you if you get him opened up. What we need to do is find out what the real reason so that we can address it. Mm -hmm. And so sure enough, the Irwin goes down there and finally pulls it out of him. He thinks there's a bad seed in the haystack or something. That just, just, he sees no reason why any person in their right mind would walk away from this. It's just about to turn the corner. So you know, I, I, uh, I said, well, go back. Telling. We are just as mystified. Why doesn't he go talk to Tom Northworthy, the head of the advertising also the investment and see what he can find there? Mm -hmm. And he said, Well, that's a good 
That is inc- that is insane. I mean, I th- you know the, the 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 thing behind all of this that I, I like to tell people mm-hmm. is that in addition to you know don't ever give up. Any obstacle gets in your way. Find a way. Get over it, under it, and around it, and keep going. Exactly. But but the 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 key to this is that so many people say, well, that's the best I could do. I've done everything I could do. And that's why they quit and go away. And and the, you know, I I 
found somewhere early back in those Denton days that that's not the way you get to good. The way you get to good is by holding the line and doing what you know in your heart is the right way to go and not giving in to somebody who doesn't feel it as much as you do. And in the case of this, you know, it says, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a, like a big gathering. We're going to bring in about 15 of these people and we'll pitch them all at the same time. I don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. You mean you don't want to do it? You want to talk to 15 of Dallas's richest people? I said, yeah, but I want to talk to them one at a time. I want them to come in one at a time, see our reel, listen to our story, and be able to pick me apart. Because despite whatever we put on paper about this is our presentation for you know a binge movie that's going to be an unknown dog with an unknown director and an unknown company and nobody's ever heard of before. Mm-hmm. And what is going to give us the qualification that we need. And I said, you know, you, you, you put three or four of these guys together in a room and nobody's going to ask the hard questions because they don't want to, none of them know anything about the film business. They don't want to look like idiots in front of their buddies. And, you know, I want them to be able to take the skin off my bones if they have to, to get down to where they believe. Because the whole thing, whether it fails or doesn't, is going to be dependent upon them believing that we can do what I say we can do. Mm -hmm. And I want them to walk out with every question answered and every confidence covered so that that would happen. And the, we, we wound up selling 50% of it. All of them came in, we sold one and two. And uh, wow. thanks in three, three months without a script, with nothing but the treatment, and I didn't give anybody the treatment. I told and acted the treatment for them in those meetings. So wow. I was sitting in the corner like I was with the dog, <laughs> making him stay with it and running around like it, and it, and it was. Uh, I'm glad that nobody filmed any of it, but it, it was it was something. And then we set out to make the movie and to write a script because the script wasn't even written at that point. Mm-hmm. And uh, to hire a dog trainer, and that was the next thing on the list is to hire a dog trainer and a dog. And that's just another one of those. This this is all uh, documented, probably not as deeply as you know, telling you stuff in the book that's, that uh, mm-hmm. HarperCollins Christian is coming out with called God Only Knows that is the story of that. You know, from UCLA through Benji, the whole enchilada, everything that went wrong, all the doors that were slammed, all the problems that we had because we didn't know what we were doing, and all the reshoots that we had to do. Mm-hmm. Now it all had to happen just as it was programmed and had to go through all that misery for it to ever, or we wouldn't be talking on the phone right now today. <laughs> yeah. The the first um, Benji movie was Frances Bouvier's last movie. Uh, how did she get cast as the cat lady? <laughs> <laughs> See, you, there's no question you can ask. It doesn't put, you, put us right back into that, you know, how do I get around this barrier? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Because the original Cat Lady was not Francis Bouvier. Mm-hmm. The original Cat Lady was uh, another actress, and she came in, and she's one of these old guys, you know, about the same age, maybe a little younger than Francis Bouvier. But the, the, she convinced me, or, or intimidated me, I guess, mm-hmm. letting her play the scene a little tipsy. Well, my intellect is telling me, you know, that you don't do that in a movie that is a family movie, number one, those days particularly. And number two, my emotion was telling me I don't like that, yet I still did it. And I was going up to the editing room, the old house, you know, that the dog had adopted as his home Mm -hmm. uh, in the movie was not only the set, it was our editing room was in it, our production office was in it, our dressing rooms were in it, because we were able to rent this, this old, dilapidated, beat-up house looking just exactly like you saw it. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was there, and we stumbled.
school that when Edwin Carolyn and I were looking for something that maybe we could buy and remodel, you know, refurbish and whatnot. And during the course of it, she's the one that said, you should make a great place for, you know, for Benji for this movie to know to live. Because I had written it as an inner city story, you know, basements and alleys and all that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And I took her head off almost. She said, oh, no, no, that would never, never work. This is an inner city story. This is not a... And we were driving home after seeing this house. And she tells me that. Um, and I felt really bad. I said, oh, what's the matter with you? you know, but <laughs> I, why do you say that's a bad idea? And so we turned, we zipped around. And she said, what are you doing? I said, well, I don't know. I'll call her to go back and look at it one more time. And that's life. Sure enough, that's what that's how the house came to be. And I would go up to the editing room every night after those cat scenes were shot and look at them with the editor, just knowing that they were going to be better than they were yesterday. <laughs> and and of course they weren't. And so we had two choices, bite the bullet, leave it, or do something about it. So I put one of our my secretary, actually, who was also working in the movie, and she said, go find Francis Bogier right now. And said, well, she's retired. She's not on the show anymore, or the show quit, or whatever. I don't remember now. Yeah. And I said, well, find her. Find her. Because we need her to come do this. And I don't know what all she did and went through, but she was, was retired at that time. She was in living over in North Carolina. Mm-hmm. somewhere and she said she was done she was retired and thank you appreciate the offer she just kept on her and kept on her and kept on her and she finally said oh okay how long will it be a week five days or five, real long mm-hmm. and you know she just made the scene made the scene without her in it I mean, she's one of the, you ask people to tell you seven things about Benji, the movie Benji, that you, that you really loved or something, you know, that cat lady's always going to be in it. Mm-hmm. She was just perfect, and uh, she was a delight to work with, and, and, you know, we became friends for the moment, you know. Yeah. Haven't seen her or talked to her since, but... It's, uh, <laughs> It was it was a very special time, and and Frank Frank and the trainer mm-hmm. just oh no because he'd already sent the cats back to Los Angeles of course, and he was so happy because there were there was only one in the movie that he had five or six different ones for each little thing you know that they were doing uh, cats are not mm-hmm. favorite favorite thing for a trainer to take on <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> So it, he had to bring them all back, start them over, the pre-training and everything like that. And we got it scheduled and, and got it shot and got it done and moving on. It, uh, but the whole film was pretty much like that. It, it was, uh, we, we shot the opening scene of the movie 74 times. Wow. It was the first thing we ever shot. Why? It's probably the most difficult shot in the entire movie. But I thought it was, you know, you're supposed to start on the easiest shot in the entire movie and then work yourself into to get everybody, you know, moving on all pistons and, and happy about the process. And then you start getting into the tough stuff. No, Joe had to do it mm-hmm. on the first day of the movie. Because it's the opening scene, and the uh, if you remember it, it's a long, slow dolly with morning sounds and birds chirping coming across the lawn of this old haunted-looking house, and turns the corner, mm-hmm. like that. turns the corner and starts zooming up to this broken-out pane an upstairs window and it stops. The zoom stops, cameras, the dolly stops, and 
one beat and the dog popped head through the window and sniffed the morning air. And oh, I had to have it that way because this was the first time you see Benji. And, and, and on that downbeat when the dog popped through the window is in the, the opening music starts from the Charlie Rich mm-hmm. thing starts. And so it all had to time out perfectly. It, it was a terrible focus pulling experiment and zooming just right and mm-hmm. stopping right, everything going on. And it, uh, it worked. And I wanted it in the morning because I wanted it. I wanted you to feel immediately you have a dog, a real dog here. That's mm-hmm. what dogs do. You know, when they go out first thing in the morning and they sniff and they scratch. It's a brand new day and I want to see this. And mm-hmm. I, I wanted to extract away any possibility of folks saying this is just a dog doing tricks for a movie. And, uh, and so it all had to be there. And it was the first time we shot it. Wow. One, with all those variables, was right on the money, except for one thing. The house faced east. <laughs> wow. As the sun came up, it just turned the whole front of the house orange. Looked like it was sunset. <laughs> and, and, and I should have known that. You know, I, yeah. My photography experience. So, oh, God. So what are we going to do? We have, to, we have to shoot it at dusk so that everything's backlit and that, that will burn up and any move to orange and it'll keep everything soft and nice like it should be in the morning. Mm-hmm. And, and so, of course, the first time we did that, we've been working all day in you know, Texas summer heat. The dog had an air conditioner that traveled around with him. I mean, it started out being a small, I mean, a large portable unit, but it wound up being a, a full-blown compressor on a trailer that had to go with the dog wherever he went because it was so hot that if he didn't, he pulled the dog out to shoot, his tongue's hanging out, you know, dragging the floor, panting, and you can't get a dog to act when his tongue's hanging out, panting. <laughs> so that was, of course, the second try a week later was there was a lesson learned there. You don't try to get morning look, freshness, and all of that. Even though the dog had been put in the crate for an hour or so and let John relax, take a nap, all that. No, he hit the window and he looked like he'd been drugged through in the streets or something, which he had been all day. And, uh, and so we kept doing things. Finally, the, the last session was dog goes to bed at in the air conditioning it's slightly lower than it should be and we built a uh, a second Frank already had one set of, of uh, what do you call it when you're, when you're in construction and you scaffolding yeah uh, and it was up at the level of the porch that the window looked out on and to keep him off the porch itself because he would wind up in the camera if he wasn't. So he had to work on that. We built another set of scaffolding and put on it a, a uh, skillet, mm-hmm. electric skillet with bacon in it, a uh, little slow wafting fan right behind the pan, just off camera, near the camera, wafting under the window. Then <laughs> <laughs> she got wake away. Wakened up by this time, I think he, he knew the gig anyway because we'd done it so many times. And, uh, and sure enough, he hit the window. And right first thing, sniff, 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 there's that <laughs> bacon on the window. <laughs> and cut, Brent got it. And did a close up, get the, uh, uh, the yawn. But it was that kind of stuff, nothing quite that bad, but all that kind of stuff all day long. We had the opportunity to say, well, that's almost close enough. They would, yeah, we'll just have to make that work. Amazing, amazing. R- really quickly, I was curious, how on earth did you come up with this story about Chevy Chase turning into Benji with Oh Heavenly Dog? 
I don't know, actually. <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I love caper movies. You know, we did one one time called the Double MacGuffin that did not do well because we lost our big stars and yeah. had no market, no uh, uh, marquee value you know, going in. But it was it was a really fun movie for me, and, and because it, it was a caper movie and it and it was and it was a good movie and it worked well and uh, had a little cult following for a while. Uh, I don't know. I uh, we've seen. I mean, there have been things similar to that in the past, and I don't know if something just pulled up or whatnot. Shaggy Dog. Uh, I, I do remember that that uh, you know during that period while I was writing and and doing the script, and, I, they, they had a re-release of Lady in the Tramp theatrically. Mm-hmm right in that period and I wouldn't go because I did not want to be influenced by it and I was astounded when I didn't <laughs> see it again after the whole thing was over with at how much I had been influenced by it I just didn't realize it you know, subconsciously and I think one of the opening scenes in the movie is the paper boy going down throwing paper you know into the porches of the houses and the dog comes out picks up a paper and drops off with it you know, Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's in Lady in the Tramp. And I could never have told you that that was not original. <laughs> that <laughs> happened to be my oldest son who was doing that. And uh, so I, I, I don't really know how uh, the old Heavenly Dog thing came into the brain. But what's. Uh, it, it, it was probably set up by the fact that we wanted to put Benji into a position where Benji was still doing his Benji shtick, even though you were hearing Chevy Chase over Mm -hmm. the thing. And because what Benji was doing was matching what Chevy Chase was saying. And so together they they made another Benji movie. I tried to get Fox to... uh, later to take out a couple of the things that made it go PG and so that we could throw it in and really call it a Benji movie along with all the others and, and mm-hmm. where it's better and but they wouldn't do it so it never happened. Didn't didn't Chevy like quit halfway through production or something? No, no. Chevy was great. I mean I, I had big fears because that was right in his peak Mm-hmm. And, and you know he was known to be a doper and and I had fears with it you know we, we started out wanting uh, 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 Burt Reynolds mm-hmm. in the part and I don't know if that would have been better or not I think it probably would have just because he's a, he, he always plays a likable guy and yeah Chevy doesn't always do that. And we had this notion that we could put Chevy's audience and Benji's audience together. And what we actually created was, you know, both of them saying, Well, the guys, Benji sold out. Chevy Chase is sold out. <laughs> and so you know, it didn't do, did not do well. In fact, that's, that is the lowest box office. And the highest budget. Wow. And Jane Seymour, she was great to work with? Who? Jane Seymour. Oh, yeah. She, yeah, she, she, she was fine. She was a little bit of a pill uh, at one point when you know we had the Rainmakers going and she was sopping wet and she and Chevy were out there bumping into each other and that kind of thing. And and I, I never forgot, you know, because Chevy was, he was just a dream all the way through. And if he, if he did any dope problem, during the, the period of production and everything, I did not notice it. And he was there, he was working hard, he was doing his gig, he wasn't complaining. And in fact, he got all over Jane Seymour for, you know, this is why you get the big buck, lady. Get up and do your job. And, uh, and, it, was, and it was kind of funny. You know. But Jane Seymour, up until that point, had played character roles. Mm-hmm. She, she was a 
Dallas cheerleader. She's a British lady, you know, and, and you know, period pieces and things like that, like the television thing she had done. She did that later, but she right. the kind of roles that she was used to, somebody else playing somebody else. She walked me into her room one time and opened the closet door and said, this is, because I said, all, all I want you to do is be you. Just be you. You know, you're not, you're not a character that in some way you're a reporter and, you, you know, you're a writer and you, you're looking for information to do this story and, and just it's the way you would. She walks me into her room, opens the door, opens the closet and says, which one of these is me? I don't have a clue who I am. I said, I do <laughs> <laughs> you got to have a clue who you are. You're you right now talking to me. You know that's where we want you to be. We're not making up characters. So she had a problem with that, but it was her own problem, and she did well. You know, and she mm -hmm. got on, and we got on fine. You know, all was basically said and done. And she, uh, I remember, she brought up. She drove. We were shooting out. And, uh, well, Watership down, actually, uh, out in the, you know, the rabbit territory and whatnot when we were doing some helicopter work with the, the red car that she drove. And I think it was periods going back and forth between London and Paris or something. And she drove a station wagon out filled with wine and rolls and things for the crew that day. Del Beaujolais had did the Beaujolais for the year, it just been released the day before or something. She brought a bunch of that. And it was very thoughtful. Mm -hmm. No, she was not, there was nobody in her. And Omar was great. You know, I mean, I really enjoyed Omar Sharif. He's, mm -hmm. unlike a lot of actors, you know, he goes deeper than skin. He's, he's really an interesting guy to talk to. And my wife hated him because he's a feminist. Yeah. <laughs> a, a womanizer, I guess is a better word. But and he is. But you know, it didn't make him an uninteresting character. We had several dinners and we had great fun going, you know, hours later than we should have. We had to get up the next morning. But yeah. and one of the great moments for me, who I'm still a stargazer, you know, I don't care, you know, Carolyn and, and Kathleen too, my current wife, you know, just mm -hmm just work, you know, it's no big <laughs> deal, but I, I, it still is to me, and one of the big kicks of, of, the, of my career, I guess, is we were in, in we were shooting in Montreal, mm -hmm. and we were looking at dailies every night, and we let anybody in who wants to see them, you know, in any of the cast or crew. Yeah, and uh, and so he and I were sitting together, and we surprised him one night. And after dailies, I got up and asked everybody, "We have a surprise if you want to stay and watch." Uh, I'm sure you've all heard of a picture called Doctor Zhivago. Yes, <laughs> and we're going to see it. <laughs> and and I got to watch Doctor Zhivago sitting next to Omar Sharif, and that was a kick. <laughs> that was it was great fun. And wow.
may have you know 28 lines of dialogue. I think it's more than that, but it's really small. <laughs> However, <laughs> when you go down and count them, which I did after the back, there, see, uh, he said, but trust me, this thing is all put together. Somebody says, Dr. Chivago, yours is the face that's going to pop up in their mind. And <laughs> it was. That's the truth. It happened that way. And it, he had all kind of tales like that. He told some wild and crazy tales about Lawrence of Arabia. Oh, that's wonderful. That's he wrote who, you know, what a raconteur, I guess you'd say he was. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, when they were shooting out in the desert, they'd shoot for a big string of days, you know, like not more than a week, like a two-week or a three-week, just straight through, and then be off for three or four or five days. And so they, whew, they were on the, the, the shuttle for the next, the closest, you know, town with bars. <laughs> That's <laughs> how they spent their four or five days. But anyway, that's off the topic. So, so after um, Benji off the leash, did you decide that you were going to retire? Uh, no. Why? Did I? Uh, that's supposed to. <laughs> that's the most recent um, movie you've made. Are Are you trying to make an, another one? No, that's not true. Uh, actually, Benji the Hunted was after, after, what did you ask? What, which one did you ask about? Oh, Benji off the leash. Oh, oh you were right. I thought you had it. I don't know. I was still hanging up on Oh Heavenly Dog, I guess. <laughs> uh, no, it wasn't an overt decision to retire. It's just, you know, I, I kind of went in, I, I had a little mild depression on how it, uh, how it did not do well, and it's it's good a movie. I mean, I think it's it's one of my favorites. It's, it's not my favorite of uh, all because of the value that it does for you know shelter dogs, and homeless dogs, and so forth. We we did over a billion. Um, we we created more than a billion media exposures for mm -hmm. shelters and homeless dogs. And pets during the search for Benji in shelters around the country before that movie was done and with the promotion of the movie. And uh, I'm really proud of that. I was really upset when the movie didn't do any better. But the first first four Benji movies, three of them were in the top 10% of the box office. And the first one, like I said earlier, was number three for the, for the year. And that was the year Jaws was out. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and so, it, you know, it's, it, I was depressed. But you know, it's another one of the situations where God had other plans. And uh, uh, it led me through Kathleen into horses. And I wound up writing a lot about how horses. 95% of the horses that are kept domestically in this country or in the world really uh, are not living in a manner that is that their genetics are asking for and requiring. Yeah. And when I got into it, started trying to figure out how to treat these horses, you know, we, we wound up at buying a, a house out in the North County of San Diego, North San Diego County. And it's, it's kind of as far into the sticks as you can get in California. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it's kind of hot, deserty sort of terrain and so forth. And, uh, and so we wound up in this place, and it had three stalls, two stalls actually, uh, just outdoor horse stalls with a roof over half of each one of them kind of thing. Mm -hmm kind of cute. They were sitting down the hill away from our place as we would look out to the west and have a little glass of wine in the evening and um, look at and you know, see those stalls down there and one of us would say, wouldn't it be nice if there were a couple of horses <laughs> hanging out, walking back and forth uh, in this beautiful sunset to the west like a postcard. And uh, a week or two 
later, Kathleen drags me out of bed and says, come on, get the car. And what, 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 what? And she says, just, you know, just get in the car. You'll see. And it happened to be on my birthday, and I, so I figured there was some kind of skullduggery going on, but didn't know what. And she finds out she goes down the hill into Escondido and turns the corner into this big park that has been given by a big ranch. Mm-hmm. Horses are wonderful animals. As, a, as I said in the first book, they should, we should have named them, you know. Should have named them? Yeah, the, the, but the, I'm trying to think of the, the names that I wanted to name. I should have named them, but I, that escapes me as well right now. But it, the bottom line was we had three horses and we didn't have a clue. wonderful. right now. 
now we have seven. They 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 are out twenty four seven, free to go wherever they want to go. The barn has a breezeway and a side shed that has panels on either side that are open all the time on both the side shed and the barn, so they can come in anytime they want. They can get out of the sun or the flies or the rain or the cold if they if it's getting wet or whatever. And and they make the choices. That's wonderful, Joe. I'm glad that um, the current, present time is um, treating you very well, that uh, you get to work uh, with another passion of yours, which is horses. And um, you've created such a legacy with these Benji movies. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but Alfred Hitchcock was a big fan of them. I did. Somebody, somewhere, it was long after, but somebody did tell me, and, and We've got Spielberg and Oprah on record saying that their favorite screen animal is Benji. Wow! <laughs> but I didn't know about Hitchcock, and I, you know, was a big fan during you know his run. And in fact, you know that one movie I was telling you about, Double McGuffin, is you know uh, opens with a narrative mm-hmm. about what the McGuffin is and where it came from. Hitchcock made it famous. But anyway, the 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 uh, it has uh, and by the way, that wasn't the last movie. The last Benji movie was twenty eighteen. Oh, I didn't even realize that. Released on Netflix, written and directed by my youngest son. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. In fact, that in fact the the, the original. The original Benji and the second Benji, Benji uh, for the love of Benji, mm-hmm. uh, both predated any such thing as high definition and wide screens and all that stuff. And so all the transfers to video were, you know, the, whatever it is, two by three, the square format. And so the last in, in 2018, both Benji and for the love of Benji were remastered. From the original negative in widescreen, high definition, blue ray, etc., mm-hmm. and they are on Netflix as well. Those two, and Benji off the leash, and the Christmas special that we did for ABC was shot on film, and so it has been remastered to uh, widescreen, high definition, blue ray, and it's on Netflix as well. So everything except Benji's the hunted. Uh, on Netflix mm-hmm. as we speak, and uh, not not uh, <coughs> not a heavenly dog because I still don't actually categorize this as a Benji movie. It's a movie in which Benji acted, but uh, yeah. so yeah, and 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 Benji, out, Benji the Hunted is. Yeah. It was, it was made independently, like the others. The, uh, against my will, too, believe it or not, as much as I was a Disney fan, mm-hmm. like when, uh, I didn't want to do it because I knew what was likely to happen to it. It, it made it into the top 10% of the box office. It was one of those. Uh, but it, it, was, uh, it was not a Disney movie, and they didn't own it. 
they didn't care. They were just filling a slot. They had a hole in their summer schedule because something dropped out or didn't get finished in time or something. Mm -hmm. That's why they wanted it. And we found out to the fact that that was true after the fact. But I was I was one of three partners in their general partnership that put the money together for the production of that movie. And I lost. Those two said, oh, man, Disney's the best family thing in the world. And they are. But that doesn't mean that they're going to do our picture the same as we could have done it ourselves. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to check out the one that your son made. I, I did not know that one even existed. I'm glad it does, though. Yeah, it's, one, it's, it's, it's the one, you know, it, the name of it is Benji. Mm -hmm. and, and in a manner of speaking, it kind of follows the trajectory of the first one. But it's a whole, you wouldn't probably even recognize that if you just went at it cold. But it's the one that has the Netflix in the upper left-hand corner mm -hmm. uh, on the little box when, you, when you're looking on Netflix uh, and the, all the other binging movies that are on that oh, service does not, do not have Netflix in the corner. But you're lucky. He really did a bang-up job. He did it himself. I read the script and read a couple of versions of it. We talk on uh, various occasions about things and about the deal more than anything else and how he's been. Because he, he was in his third production deal when it finally came to pass. Mm -hmm. He started with Walden. Remember Walden? Walden. Walden Media. Oh. No. Uh, did a whole bunch of movies. He was a uh, super Christian in Denver. It felt like he could change you know, the, the marketplace and did some good movies. He did Holes. Mm -hmm. Walden Group did. And so we thought it was a natural thing. That's where Benji, where Brandon went first. And he had the deal. The deal was done. He was ready to go. He was ready to be greenlit. Blah, blah, blah. And the guy who owned the multi-billionaire who owned the company walked in and fired everybody except the CFO and uh, started over. Nice. Wow. Boink. Went away. <laughs> Brandon, again, you know, persistence. And not quitting, not giving up. Then, he, then there was a sojourn at, I think it was Universal, and then wound up at uh, Blumhouse. <laughs> That's your market. <laughs> <laughs> People laugh. Oh my God, is Benji making a horror movie? <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh, hilarious! Well, Joe, I thank you so much for coming on today. Um, I hope uh, you have happy holidays and and um, you continue riding your horses and writing the books and the, all that stuff. Yeah, we're going to continue with all of it. And I appreciate it. Appreciate being on, and uh, you just let me run on it. Mouth. Kathleen says that's really dangerous. You should talk to her first about how to shut me up or redirect me, and it works. <laughs> it's okay. They want to hear you, not me. <laughs> uh, but it's, uh, I appreciate it. And uh, uh, if you ever get down Nashville way, give us a holler. Oh, I would love to. That would be wonderful that you see your horses. Uh, about an hour south of Nashville, and you can get your, uh, get your horse fix. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. Thank you, sir. Have happy holidays and have a great rest of your day. Have a great Thanksgiving and a Merry Christmas to you and all your folks. You too, sir. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Joe Camp. Ain't he a cool dude? Thank you so much, Joe. You are an amazing man full of perseverance and inspiration all the pain and suffering you went through to make that little movie about a little dog who saves some lives. That's just amazing of an accomplishment. Um, if you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all the time we have this week on... Splat from the past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.